My TV career began completely by accident. I had no ambitions to be on television at all. In fact, the thought really hadn't crossed my mind. I was working with Billy Bragg as his driver, tour manager, Rody, all rolled into one. And it was in the spring of 1984 when we got the call at the office, would Billy like to appear on uh, the whistle test on BBC Two? And it was, uh, as always, live at seven o'clock on a Tuesday evening. But in the nature of television, as I was soon to discover, uh, much of your time in television is spent sitting around. I got chatting to the producer, he was a nice guy. And it's, uh, he mentioned his name, Trevor Dan, he's a producer of uh, John Peel radio sessions some years earlier and about a week later Billy phoned me and he said here Kirsch want to go and see B.B. King tonight at the Hammersmith Audion so Billy and I agreed that we'd go on the tube and we'd meet each other on the steps of the Hammersmith Audion we then took our seats on about the third row of the front stalls for B.B. King and the seats next to us were Trevor Dan the producer of the whistle test who we'd seen only the week before when Billy had done his first performance Trevor said, are you uh, staying at Pete Jenner's in Maida Vale? I said, that's right. He said, oh, I'm go going back that way myself. I can give you a lift. And we got in Trevor's car, and Trevor suddenly, without saying anything, swerved the car into this bus lay-by, stopped and switched off the engine. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? And he turned to me and he said, I'd like you to be one of the presenters of the next series of whistle tests starting in September. And that's how it happened. Live Aid was... Um, produced out of the Whistle Test office by the Whistle Test production team. Trevor said to me one day, Andy, I um, need you to make a weekend clear in your diary in, in July, six weeks notice. And he said, it's the um, it's big concert at Wembley, you know, the Geldof thing, the Ethiopian uh, famine, the, the, the charity. Can you just keep the Saturday free? That was it. I was, I was booked for Live Aid. With these big gaps between groups performing, which when you're doing live television presentations, you have to fill somehow. And the easiest way to fill them is to get somebody to come and talk to you. We had a team of runners going, grabbing anybody who was vaguely famous, rock star or uh, a, a, a lesser specimen, and bring them all the way up to our box so we can plonk them down on the sofa just to chat and keep things going. And at one point, I'm sitting there on the sofa and there's some video running so the camera wasn't actually on me, it wasn't going out live. And they're all in the great tears and there's walkie-talkies screaming and crackling and somebody suddenly shouts, ah, fantastic, we've, we've got John Hurt, we've got John Hurt's coming everybody, John Hurt, he's coming up now. And I'm sitting there and I said to him, who's John Hurt? And this fella, John Hurt, do you know him? Do you know John Hurt? And everybody is preoccupied with something else. I said, who, John Hurt, who is he? And there's, now, now there's a floor manager going, and 30 seconds studio. And at that point, I just got Trevor's eye. And I said, John, and this man smiling and nodding at me from the door, who I took to be John Hurt. And then they bring him in, they plonk him down on the sofa next to me. And just as they're plonking him down, Trevor mouths over the camera to me, actor, actor, elephant man. And that's all the information I had. Actor, elephant man. He's been in a film called Elephant Man. I say something like, um, well, John, we can see today what the, um, the rock and roll community uh, is doing to try and relieve the famine in Ethiopia. Do you think perhaps the acting profession might respond with some similar kind of event? And he was such a bloody poppet. He just about then interviewed himself until God knows who it was, Howard Jones or, uh, uh, you know, Sting or whoever it was came on. Uh, had he been a monosyllabic grump, I would have been absolutely sunk in front of a billion people. And about 15 years later, I'm at this BBC Cheese and Wine do, and across this room with all the great and the good, I see John Hurt. And I said to him, you know, I told him who I was, and I said, the last time you and I met, you may have forgotten, I said, but it was um, at Live Aid in the um, commentary box, and I interviewed you on the day on live television. I said, <clears throat> I wonder whether you had any idea at the time that when they sat you down on that sofa, I hadn't got a clue who you were or what you did. Uh, and he said, well, I, I, I did, did rather get something of an inkling. And I said, in which case, you're an absolute sweetheart. Come here. <laughs> what a lovely bloke. I've always been, first and foremost, a radio man. I think that's my natural environment. There's an intimacy between a radio presenter and listener, which I don't think there is between television presenter or reporter and viewer. But having said that, I've hugely enjoyed all the television I've done over the last almost 30 years. 
um, because I was very, very lucky. To start with, I was presenting the whistle test, and there's a couple of chapters and, entirely about that experience in my book and about what m massive fun it was. It was like a, it was like the rock music programme with air levels made by a few pals in the sixth form common room. That's what it felt like. And I explain more in the book why it was great. It was also made on a complete shoestring. That was three pals sharing their enthusiasms irreverently with the nation. After the whistle test, I suppose my main television activity was again, I got very, very lucky. I fell in with a production company who were making a travel programme for Channel 4 and called Travelogue. It was a travel programme for people who had rucksacks rather than suitcases and didn't bother to book a hotel before they left. For much of the nights, I was making travel uh, documentaries for Travelogue and Channel 4, which took me to places like uh, Albania, not long after Albania had finally shed communism, what an extraordinary place that was. I made the very first documentary film made by any television company from the West inside North Korea in 1995 or 6. Um, Romania, not that long after the Ceausescu's had fallen. I remember going into the office one day and them saying to me, where would you like to go in the next series? I said, Mozambique. And the next thing I knew, we were off to bloody Mozambique, whilst the civil war was still going on. Um, and Kyrgyzstan, when no, you know, it was one of those countries that emerged with the collapse of the Soviet Union, no one had heard of Kyrgyzstan. Not even the Kyrgyz had heard of Kyrgyzstan at the, when I first went there. Um, so I was going to some extraordinary places and making these, uh, I like to think, extraordinary films. And uh, of all the television jobs that I've done over the years, I, if I were asked which programme uh, are you most proud of, I would have to say it would be the North Korea one because it was such a first. I pestered the North Korean authorities before they let us in on that occasion for seven years to let me go in. And for seven years they said no. But you, can, you, you can't look for logic, with, really, with the North Koreans and these decisions. And to this day, I have no idea why they turned around in 1995 or 96 and said to me, yes, on this uh, occasion, Mr Andy, you can come in. And what's more, yes, you can bring a, a television crew from Channel 4 with you and you can make a documentary. But they did. They let us in. And my God, it was an experience. And I've been back three times since. And the reason I've been back three times since is every time I go... I can't I get back and I can't actually believe uh, that what just, I've just experienced was in fact reality. So I have to keep going back for another look. Lots of people express surprise that I made an apparent career leap in the late 80s, early 90s uh, from radio DJ into foreign correspondence. But it didn't surprise me because I'd always been the instinctive journalist and the amateur historian. The whole business with... Uh, live music, rock and roll, uh, and the intervention of television and radio was just an interruption, really, to something that had been going on long before I got involved in those things. And my, what I saw as my return to it in the late 80s was just a continuation after that interruption. But I just happened to be doing it on a, an international level rather than on a local newspaper level. Deep down, it was something I'd always wanted to do. And I also found I wasn't bored doing my Radio 1 programmes, not at all. In fact, on the contrary, it, you know, it was very, very rewarding. I was in that very lucky position of being the only other person on Radio 1 apart from John Peel, who had a free hand in choosing his own music. But I did feel I wasn't being pushed enough, or I wasn't pushing myself enough. And we were living through, at then, extraordinary times. The world was in probably uh, a, a sort of spin cycle as turbulent as it had been at the end of the 1960s, which was a period I grew up in, and that's when I became aware of the world and all those dramatic events of 1968-69 had got me fired up and made me very politically aware and, and journalistically aware. Uh, and when it came round again, a similar period in the late 80s, I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to be an eyewitness to historical events. I've always been a big believer of the baptism by fire, the in at the deep end approach, and that was true with... Um, foreign journalism when I decided to um, go back into, into journalism. The place at the time which made, 1988-89, uh, which made most people recoil, even journalist pals of mine, when I, when I mentioned I was thinking of going there, was Haiti. 
in the Caribbean. The place fascinated me, and I'd read Graham Greene's The Comedians as well about Haiti in the mid-60s. So I took myself off to Haiti, and I think it was late 89, and it certainly was a baptism by fire. I would be dishonest if I denied that there's a certain amount of romance in, that there isn't a certain amount of romance in the foreign correspondence thing. But it's, for me, it's mainly that I witnessed the history thing. And it is a privilege to be able to see world-shattering events.